Welcome to Year in Review, the show where we break down a year to bring you some of the most notable moments in TV and film month by month. The 1980s are a treasure chest of hits that Hollywood keeps going back to, and 1989 is no exception. The year is remembered most by fans for giving us the first modern big screen Batman, plus the year also gave us many television shows that would become defining series of the 1990s. From the earlier sketches of The Simpsons and Seinfeld and the brilliance of Do the Right Thing, join us as we venture back to the defining movies and television shows that ended the 80s. Teleporting telephone booth not required. In 1987, filling in on The Late Show for a fired Joan Rivers, Arsenio Hall became the first black host of a late night talk show. Though the Hall hosted shows was a ratings boost, he left when his contract was up saying that he had plans to do other things. Other things meant co-starring opposite his friend Eddie Murphy in Coming to America and creating his own talk show with his own name. You are right, 500,000. As long as you ask him, why don't we go for a cool million? You do not think that would be too much? Hall's loose atmosphere, including audience dog chants and segments on things that make you go, hmm, the nightly series left a lasting mark on the landscape, but it couldn't survive the Leno Letterman late night feud after Johnny Carson retired. From things that make you go, hmm, to things that make you go, whoa! Following two endearing dimwits who traveled through time to better understand high school history, Bill and Ted would become a beloved pop culture franchise for its ability to make you laugh with its characters instead of at them. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Dudes, you guys are gonna go back in time. Yeah! You are going to have the most excellent adventure through history. Who are you guys? We're you, dude! No way. No way. Yes way, Ted! Two sequels and an animated series would follow Excellent Adventure, and though the slacker buddy comedy would attempt to be replicated, it's safe to say that no other film has combined Van Halen with Socrates. Critics say, Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter are just charming, goofy, and silly enough to make this fluffy time travel adventure work. Time travel was a theme throughout 1989, which included the inventive sci-fi TV drama Quantum Leap. But past experience tells me we're probably gonna get stuck with her. You know, you look like you've been in a fight with a wild cat. If you're gonna sneak up on me, at least you could have the decency to reflect in the mirror. Scott Bakula played Dr. Beckett, a physicist who leaps into the bodies of people throughout the history of mankind to correct historical mistakes. Simply by trying to get Beckett back to the time that he knows from his own experiences, Quantum Leap was able to apply a narrative structure to individual Twilight Zone-like episodes. Quantum Leap debuted in March 1989 and ran for five seasons on NBC. Similar to Bill and Ted, Quantum Leap has remained a popular cultural reference due to its core message of trying to instill decency and kindness to keep from repeating the past. Oh boy. Oh. No, I told you. It's a girl. Critics say, Quantum Leap's fresh and funny take on science fiction elevates its simple premise into a charming piece of classic television. Get my hopes up, Lloyd. I'm sorry. It's just you're a really nice guy and we don't want to see you get hurt. I want to get hurt! Lloyd Dobler wants to feel something. At the start of Say Anything, the aspiring kickboxer and average student, played by John Cusack, has decided to ask out Diane Court, the class valedictorian, played by Ione Skye, immediately after graduating. Cameron Crowe's directorial debut hoists up the rom-com boombox for a new generation. It's set in Seattle just before grunge takes over, but of course still present in that desire to drop out of society and rethink what's an acceptable style and approach to life. Is this where we can add that since the setting is in Seattle and it was released in April, Say Anything offers a fitting John Cusack rain scene? She gave me a pen. She gave my heart and she gave me a pen. 
Critics say, one of the definitive Gen X movies say anything is equally funny and heartfelt, and it established John Cusack as an icon for left of center types everywhere. Why is it always raining on sad Cusack? Time travel in 1989 pop culture continued via the most unlikely source imaginable, a cornfield in Iowa. Hey, is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. Field of Dreams was a heartwarming drama for the heartland. It starred Kevin Costner as a farmer who hears a saying, He doesn't know what it or who he is, but through a vision, he decides that it is a baseball field in his cornfield. Eventually, the disgraced Chicago White Sox of 1919 wander out from the stocks and start playing ball. Field of Dreams showcases the joy and spectacle of sports at the most reduced level without money or legacy on the line. It has built its own, they don't make them like they used to legacy, however. In 2021, a regular season game between the Yankees and White Sox was played at the site of the film. With Costner in attendance, the game drew the highest TV ratings of any regular season game that aired that year. Critics say, Field of Dreams is sentimental, but in the best way. It's a mix of fairy tale, baseball, and family togetherness. The third Indiana Jones film was a coarse reset by Steven Spielberg after Temple of Doom was met with a more divisive reaction than Raiders of the Lost Ark. No underground child slavery camps here. Instead, we get a whip-smart young Indiana Jones played by River Phoenix to deliver the most positive message that whatever Indiana Jones finds belongs in a museum. You got heart, kid. But that belongs to me. Belongs to Coronado. Coronado's dead, and so are all of his grandchildren. This should be in a museum. The Last Crusade repeats the bad guys of Raiders with evil Nazis trying to locate a sacred artifact again, but what Spielberg is most interested in is a son trying to win the respect of his father, which actually makes it a spiritual companion to Field of Dreams. If you put it in a museum, respect will come. That belongs in a museum. Critics say, lighter and more comedic than its predecessor, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade returns the series to the brisk serial adventure of Raiders while adding a dynamic double act between Harrison Ford and Sean Connery. But you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> We could devote a museum to all the different iterations of a big screen Batman movie that didn't happen, but in 1989, a modern take finally made it to the big screen. Despite its title, Jack Nicholson contractually received top billing as Joker opposite Michael Keaton's Batman. Director Tim Burton was attached to the film after the success of Pee-wee's Big Adventure, but it didn't receive a studio green light until his and Keaton's Beetlejuice became a financial success in 1988. Burton described his approach to bringing Batman, Joker, and Gotham to life was by envisioning it all as, quote, a complete duel of the freaks. Nicholson's permanent smile makeup was matched by the Art Deco designs of Gotham. The set design won an Oscar, making Batman the first comic book movie to win a competitive Oscar. Bruce Wayne's dual persona of wealthy playboy and vigilante enforcer added to the visual clashes that Burton created. Keaton was concerned that Wayne's identity as Batman would be too easily discernible, and so he decided to voice each persona in different vocal registers, something that every Batman has done since. I'm going to kill you. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. Critics say, an eerie, haunting spectacle, Batman succeeds as dark entertainment, even if Jack Nicholson's Joker too often overshadows the title character. Wake up! Wake up, wake up, wake up! Up you wake, up you wake, up you wake, up you wake! 
Do the Right Thing is one day and night on a bed block in Brooklyn. Like heat baking into the cement, tensions rise by the hour between the African-American community and the Italian-American pizzeria that refuses to put up any black celebrities on its wall of fame. Spike Lee's film is alarmingly accurate on race relations in America from 1989 to 30 plus years later. From the police who patrol neighborhoods to gentrifiers moving in and small businesses in minority neighborhoods that don't reflect the demographics of their patrons. Hold up! Time out! Time out! Y'all take a chill! You need to cool that sh out! Lee explores every aspect of race, but his film remains loose, funny, and tender until its shocking conclusion. Critics say, smart, vibrant, and urgent without being didactic, Do the Right Thing is one of Spike Lee's most fully realized efforts and one of the most important films of the 1980s. So, you know, she called and said she wants to go out with you tomorrow night? God bless! <laughs> Devil you! Yeah, well, not exactly. I mean, she said, you know, she called this morning and said she had to come in for a seminar and maybe we'd get together. So, you know. Oh, oh, oh. Had to? Yeah. Had to come in? Yeah, but... Had to come in? Yeah, and but... maybe we'll get together? Had to and maybe? Yeah. No. No, no, I hate to tell you this, you're not gonna see this one. Famously called The Show About Nothing, Seinfeld debuted in July 1989 and changed television comedy forever. Though Jerry Seinfeld had a wacky neighbor, what his show didn't have was a wacky premise. It simply was about friends who went about their day, careers, and love lives and tried to make sense of it all. The observation humor of reading people's body language or mundane discussions of button placements on a shirt dazzled critics starved for something new and exciting. Seinfeld ran for nine seasons and left a lasting mark on pop culture. The first season mostly irons out the characters we'd come to love and shamefully see ourselves in, though the show about nothing became the catchphrase descriptor, Seinfeld and co-creator Larry David actually pitched the show as the mundane occurrences in daily life that could become material for a comedian stand-up routine. TV critics championed Seinfeld in its early seasons, even as it was slow to cultivate a substantial audience. But by season four, Seinfeld cracked the top 30 in the ratings and the rest is history, including a history-making deal during which all nine seasons were bought by Hulu in 2015 for $180 million, a price too rich for everyone else until Netflix secured the rights in 2021. Critics say, Seinfeld's first season lays out the template for the show's unique style, effectively outlining the hugless, lesson-free humor that would later make it an oft-imitated classic. I was trying to lead the way. We needed a leader, someone to lead the way to safety. 1989 saw two timeless rom-coms with ellipses in their titles. When Harry Met Sally shares more in common with Say Anything than the dot 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 after its title, however. Both films highlight how friendships with the opposite sex can make men better equipped to become thoughtful partners. In Rob Reiner's comedy written by Nora Ephron, that includes listening to a friend fake an orgasm in a restaurant to prove a point on the ease of manipulating fragile male egos. Are you okay? Oh. Oh, God. Ooh. Oh, God. Oh. The classic scene with the perfect punchline was suggested to be performed as is by Meg Ryan to the delight of Efron. When the script had become uneven, Efron suggested Sally discuss faking an orgasm, but it was the star who took it to the next level, saying that she could do it on the spot at a crowded restaurant. Oh. I'll have what she's having. Positive <clears throat> word of mouth paid off at the box office with no fakery. Critics say Rob Reiner's touching funny film set a new standard for romantic comedies, and he was ably abetted by the sharp interplay between Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan. NBC's Saturday morning audience was losing to the competition when it attempted a new approach, a live-action comedy filmed in front of a studio audience to try to take teens away from Saturday morning cartoons. 
Saved by the Bell was a retooled update of a canceled Disney Channel show, Good Morning Miss Bliss. Though Miss Bliss didn't work on Disney, creator Peter Ingle took positive notice about the student characters and came to NBC with a show entirely based around teenagers. The teen characters of Zack, Jesse, Kelly, Screech, Lisa, and Slater would become defining for a generation. Though the show was as educational and informative as after school specials, it was the lovable characters that made the PSAs go down easy. Some of which would become shared punchlines when kids got older and realized that the big scary drug episode was about caffeine pills. Pills? You mean you really are taking drugs? I need them. Jesse, give me those. I need them, Zach. I have to sing. Jesse, you can't sing tonight. Yes, I can. Jesse, Jesse. <laughs> Baywatch, another unconventional television success, debuted on NBC in September 1989. It only lasted one season, however. Yes, you heard that correctly, no need to rewind. While Baywatch did become the most watched American show on Earth, it became that through syndication. 1.1 billion people watched around the world at the height of its popularity. It was star David Hasselhoff who believed that there was still potential for the show and he purchased the rights after cancellation and sold Baywatch in syndication to numerous US and international markets. Hasselhoff's popularity in Europe due to his music career helped turn Baywatch into a worldwide phenomenon that eventually reached back to the shores of the USA. Let's cue a Borat, shall we? Parker, CJ. Pleasure to meet you, CJ. Be careful! Be careful, CJ! Throughout its lengthy run, the cast of beauties rotated around Hasselhoff and the red swimsuits continued to shrink. While many aligned to mock the show, there is no denying how much the lifeguard melodrama dominated pop culture. But while the media focus was always on the skimpy attire and used dismissive terms like Babe Watch, viewership was actually 65% female. A BBC study showed that women preferred tuning in to see other women saving lives instead of just being saved. So, see, Baywatch was important. October 1989 had eclectic family offerings atop the box office, with the baby narrated Look Who's Talking dominating the month's earnings. Right behind it was the dialogue-free French film, The Bear, which followed a bear's life from cub to full-size Kodiak. But only one of these films featured a wee bub hallucinating on mushrooms, though. With how dominant Disney animation has been from the 90s onward, it's hard to believe that there was ever a lull. But in the 80s, Disney found itself with more animation competitors than ever before. After some successful co-productions with Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, 1989 kicked off what would become known as the Disney Renaissance. This was where the studio returned to its roots and applied a musical format to classic fairy tales. And The Little Mermaid, released in November 1989, would kick off a decade of success from this approach. Disney plucked Howard Ashman and Alan Menken from the stage to provide a big new Broadway feel to the musical numbers. The Little Mermaid is the story of Ariel, a mermaid who dreams of being a human to pursue a land prince and makes a deal with Ursula the sea witch to be with him. The big musical moments are accompanied by her fish and waterfowl friends. <laughs> Jeez, mum, I'm surrounded by amateurs. You want something done, you've got to do it yourself. First, we got to create the mood. The result? Only the highest grossing animated movie of all time at the time of release. That was 211 million clams. Critics say The Little Mermaid ushered in a new golden era for Disney animation with warm and charming hand-drawn characters and catchy musical sequences. I love a 
glass of that wine Bart brought us. Sorry, Marge. Some wise guy stuck a cork in the bottle. <laughs> oh, mon père. Quel bouffon. You hear that, Marge? My boy speaks French. From one unstoppable animation effort to another, The Simpsons debuted in December 1989. From the nuclear power plant to Springfield Elementary to the Krusty the Clown show and Moe's Tavern, so many of the beloved characters and iconic locations debuted in the first few episodes. It's currently in its 33rd season with no end in sight, making The Simpsons by far the longest running scripted show in history. With more than 700 episodes aired, it'll be impossible to cover the show's lore in a brief soundbite. So let's look specifically at the program's introduction, a holiday special. The Simpsons introduced the principal family of Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie Simpson through a very identifiable family problem, feeling the money crunch as Christmas approaches. First, the evil rich boss C. Montgomery Burns denies a bonus, then a second job has added paycheck deductions. The only gift that year becomes a greyhound kicked off the racetrack for losing too much. And with that, the teachable moment, the family dynamic of laughing off life's disappointments and overall unfairness, was set for the rest of the series. I don't know, Marge. Trying is the first step towards failure. <clears throat> mm. Though the running couch gag would start in episode two. Critics say, The Simpsons' first season proves a quickly addictive introduction to America's animated first family with a run of entertaining episodes that set the stage for a groundbreaking series. Dad, didn't they invent Christmas tree lots so people wouldn't have to drive all the way out to nowhere and waste a whole Saturday? They invented them, Russ, because people forgot how to have a fun, old-fashioned family Christmas and are satisfied with scrawny, dead, overpriced trees that have no special <sighs> meaning. My toes are numb. While Christmas introduced one of the most beloved television families in December 1989, it also became the backdrop for the third vacation movie. The first two vacation films found the Griswolds on the highways and skyways, but Christmas Vacation let them stay home. Proving that it's not travel that makes Clark Griswold overreach in his attempt to give his family perfect old-fashioned fun, it's just Clark Griswold. Critics say, while Christmas Vacation may not be the most disciplined comedy, it's got enough laughs and good cheer to make for a solid seasonal treat. While the critical reception was average, Christmas Vacation has become a seasonal staple and surely has made neighborhood lighting competition fiercer. It's so lovely. <sighs> you deserve a home like this to spend Christmas in. With 1989 being such a formative year for new television shows, we had to leave off several popular movies in the summary. In this year, we saw sequels like Lethal Weapon 2, Back to the Future 2, and new franchises like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Weekend at Bernie's, and Kickboxer. Plus, critically acclaimed hits like Driving Miss Daisy, Dead Poet Society, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Born on the Fourth of July, and Drugstore Cowboy. Also, while we mentioned many television shows, 1989 was also our introduction to Doogie Howser, MD, and Family Matters. In the end, 1989 gave us the first successful comic book movie, one of the most important movies of the decade, and a whole catalog of long-lasting television mainstays. Oh, and Roadhouse! We had to fit that glorious parade of mullets somewhere in here. You're too stupid to have a good time. <laughs> Goodbye, 1980s. <laughs>